My name is Anas Arimiao Anas. I'm an undercover journalist and a lawyer. Whilst growing up in my little village, it's called Bimbila in the northern region, I learned a lot. Bimbila is predominantly a nomadic place, and we usually live in round houses. One incident happened one fine morning. A notorious thief was arrested. And the community was very happy. But within three days, this thief had been released. And the reason given by the law enforcement agencies was pretty simple. They had no evidence. So as I grew up and I became a journalist, I even saw this in a more wider scale because I realized that politicians sought refuge in always saying that there was no evidence whenever civil society began to question them with this thinking I decided to have my own type of journalism I look at three main things when I do my journalism I name shame and jail when I say naming shaming and jailing I mean that when I go undercover I collect the hardcore evidence team up with the law enforcement agencies and at the end of the day testify in the court of law to make sure that the bad guys are put behind bars. See, the people who disrupt our democracy ought to be dealt with through direct and frontal attack, not obliquely or half-heartedly. You see, there's no point in doing journalism and then at the end of the day having these bad guys and walking on the same street with them. So as I kept on moving, I have over the years done many stories and played many roles undercover. I have been a woman undercover. I've been a madman. I've been a sheikh. I've been a pimp and played many, many other roles to enable me bring that evidence. Over the years, my Chinese sex mafia story, for example, the traffickers who trafficked girls from Asia to West Africa are in jail for 45 years. Talk about the Nana Kwesiajiman story where a pastor raped girls as young as three. He's in jail for 12 years. Talk about the Seps Coco smuggling story. They are in jail put together for 16 years. So as I kept on growing, I started learning. I did go undercover as a prison inmate. And this time it was in Sawan prison. When I got in there, after having shaved my beard and all that, I got in and met the cell lord. I went and paid homage. I didn't understand the chemistry of the prison. You see, the prison is all, always has hierarchies. In the night, I was caught up and given a severe beating because I did not pay homage by paying money to the prison lord. In the prison, I found instances of human rights abuse. The food we had was being stolen by people. We had very bad health care. And it was even easier to get cannabis, cocaine, and other things in the prison than on the street. That is the prison. But the most important thing I learned in the prison and the most shocking revelations was that justice was for sale. I couldn't believe it. So when I came out of prison, I decided to investigate the little bits that I had heard from my colleagues. They basically explained that, look, I wouldn't have been in this prison but for the fact that I could not pay to that judge. So, me and my team set out to do justice to this issue. And indeed, the film was called Justice. We had 34 judges who were caught taking bribes. And it was, it was such a harrowing experience. We had 145 judicial staff also caught up taking bribes. 
And I recall one of the stories whilst we were investigating. Brobe was a coconut seller. And he had positioned himself at a suburb of Accra called Tema Station. Now, one time, another boy called Pfizer was working with a girl. Brobe got angry and asked Pfizer why she was work he was working with that beautiful girl. And Pfizer replied, Brobe got angry, took a scatlass, got into a fight, and chopped him in into pieces. This was there for everybody to see. So when I went undercover, I decided to pick up the role of being the relative of Brobe, who had killed. I went to the judge. I remember that fateful day. And there I was. I gave him the money. And he took it. Then, it was that day that I realized that indeed, our democracy was under siege. And that if we don't come together to kick out these evil people, who try to destroy our democracy, we will never be a sane country. A similar incident of robbery attack that happened in Taifa. These were real armed robbers who hurt about eight people. Again, I went undercover as a relative. And here, I went to speak to the judge. I told him that I wanted these people released. And there again, he extended his hands and collected money. And that morning, I remember, when he gave that famous judgment, it was 9 a.m., that's when he was supposed to sit. As at 9.30, he was still waiting to collect the money from me. And as soon as I paid him, all these robbers were released back to society. Then I started thinking. I also did go to some of the judges who proved to be so upright. In fact, one female judge that I stood in front of called the police. I had to run away from my dear life. And that taught me another lesson. That despite whatever happens, there are people who are willing to push the frontiers of democracy. See, as I keep doing what I do, I know that there will be problems. When I teamed up with my colleague, Stanley Nkwenda, to go to Seychelles, it was because of a special reason. You see, threats are very normal in this job that I do. Whilst I was doing this, one of my members got kidnapped and it had to take the security forces to come help. As for plot to kill me and all those, they have a daily occurrence. I get them every day. Also, some lawyers went to court. And what they requested for was for my beats to be unveiled so that they could see my face. So those of you wondering, I wear these beats because I want to be able to do that next story. I want to be able to push the frontiers of democracy. See, that day when I had that call from that anonymous caller, he told me, do not drive home. Do not use your car. So I decided to follow what I had heard. And the next morning, the bad guys had gone to attack someone and injured him. That person was driving a similar car. When you decide to do what I do, you're not going to have a normal social life. When people are going out to have fun in the pubs and the clubs, count yourself out because the bad guys are always watching. So that day, when I set out with Stanley Quenda and we went to Seychelles, it was to look for those African leaders who eventually steal our money and hide them in safe heavens. Though there are international laws that are supposed to stop people from hiding stolen wealth, looted wealth from Africa. There are still some countries who allow this to happen. So for me, looking at the executive arm of government, looking at corrupt African leaders was key to the work that I, I, I do. Because many children suffer from diseases as a result of the bad things that happen when money is stolen. So I am glad that 
in Seychelles were able to expose some of these institutions that launder our money. See, one thing I have learned over the years as I've been doing this job is that we must be willing to question institutions, well, willing to question the status quo. We do not have to believe that because we've set up institutions, they will be sacrosanct. We need to ask them the questions. It is only when we ask questions that we can find answers. We have to keep probing as journalists. Then again, if we want to keep our democracy sane, we ought to open our eyes and play our watchdog roles very well. See, when I go back to my village, I want to wear my journalism, ba my journalism badge with a lot of pride. Pride that is born out of the good deeds that my journalism has contributed to society. You see, journalism ought to be seen as a very powerful disinfectant. Not to destroy the society, but to help rid of the filth that has engulfed our society. I know, as I keep doing this over and over, there will be problems. I may die, but if I die, I take solace in the fact that I have contributed to democracy. What about you? Thank you very much.